Good morning, everyone. Clock says it's time to get started. That way we finish on time to get to lunch. <laughs> Let's all be standing for our opening hymn. You may notice that we're experiencing technical difficulties. If you're able to look at the side screens, there will be no screen behind us. I'll try to give you the hymnal uh, correlating page with the song that we sing. Some of these you probably can pull off from memory, though. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the grave, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Great singing. You may be seated. Our next hymn will be Amazing Grace, number 293 in your hymn books. Morning. <clears throat> Today's communion meditation is a poem that I wrote 21 years ago. I was inspired to write this 
after learning that churches, some in, some in our own brotherhood, were not observing the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Some churches even removed, removed the communion table from plain sight. It's like the Lord's Supper was shoved in a corner. Well, we'll just uh, we'll think about it once in a while kind of mentality. The poem is written from a perspective of someone who witnessed these things, but also got to see it restored once again. I'm glad that Pinehurst continues to realize the importance of communion time and when to observe it. I want to read uh, Matthew 26, starting in verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And I titled this uh, July of 2001, The Lost Supper. The Lord's Supper, where did it go? We used to partake in it every Sunday, you know. I remember when we would talk about churches that only observed it a few times a year. But look around this building, the table has disappeared. We used to refute the ones who took it on Saturday night, using the word of God to prove they were not right. We were taught to, to take communion every Lord's Day, but now it seems we have fallen away. We are not going to disobey the Lord anymore. Let's get things right like they were before. Jesus himself gave this supper to 12 men. Then they taught others as his church began. Take it every first day of the week. That was the plan. Who has the power to change this? Certainly not man. Enough is enough. This is the Lord's day. We'll take the Lord's supper, worship, sing, and pray. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. If we examine our hearts, we'll get stronger, you'll see. The table was ready with the juice and the bread. So many guilty thoughts are going through my head. But not for long, because the cross comes to mind. That's when Jesus shed blood to save all mankind. The plates are passed around, the emblems I now see. A simple and forever reminder of what Jesus did for me. Oh, thank you, dear Jesus, and how you forgive sin. May we choose to be here next Sunday to observe this supper again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day. I'm so grateful to be here with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And once again, at communion time, uh, with the emblems, the bread, and the cup, we are reminded of the great sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us. It is because of him we can have a great life here and a better life yet to come. Father, I ask that you just continue to bless all of us and keep us all safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
the risk of sounding overly corny, I want to say that we just had the opportunity to experience one of my favorite 35 to 45 seconds of the week, not just because of the fantastic piano playing, but the stressors and the problems and the tensions and the pains and the sufferings, all the things that happen on those other six days throughout the course of the week, all seem so small and all seem so trivial in those 35 to 45 seconds right after you had the, the blessing of taking communion together with the, with the congregation. Uh, our next hymn will be, When We All Get to Heaven, Amen. If I can read the handwriting, <laughs> I think if you turn in your hymnals to 467, you'll find, <laughs> I'm getting the thumbs up, Yes, that's good. But you can also see it on the peripheral screens as well. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed. to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will rejoicing be. that will be when we all when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be old soon the pearly Tread the streets of gold when we all when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing, that rejoicing will that will be when we all when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Shout the victory. Very nice. Our final hymn before we are uh, blessed with another message this morning, will be, I'll fly away. I, I give up. I can't read it. So you're, you, we're just going to stand up, and we're going to follow along, and we're going to sing our little hearts out. So... When this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by. life have grown I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars has flown I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. singing. You may be seated.
Good morning. We've been looking at 1 Corinthians and talking about what it means to be part of the body of Christ. And I don't know whether you've noticed it or not, but all the messages in this series focus on the idea of being the body. Uh, some of them have talked about the fact that there's one body and our unity in Christ. Or we've talked about the fact that we're part of the body and that each of us has a role in the body of Christ. This morning I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to pick up with verse 35, and we're going to talk about our resurrection body in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as He has determined, and to each kind of seed He gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And star differ, differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And so it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven, as was also those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where? Death is your victory. Where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We like to think of ourselves as being pretty technologically and scientifically advanced. And we are. There are some smart people who have made it very easy to do some tasks in this world that wouldn't have been thought of even 20 years ago. I can go to the bank from my living room and make a deposit with my phone. I can drive someplace that I've never been before and never have to look at a map. I can pick up a telephone and have a 90-day supply of my prescription delivered to my house the next day in the mail. It's amazing how technology has improved and advanced our lives. 
But there are still things that, despite our scientific advancements, there are still things that are very difficult for us to explain or understand. Let's think for a moment about language. How'd that come about? How is it that Adam and Eve were all of a sudden able to understand in their communications with each other? And how is it that they could talk to God? How is it that each of us sees ourselves as distinct entities, a person, and yet we understand that we're part of a group called people? Do the animals see life that way? Do they understand that each is significant in its own right, but there's a culture, a, a society of squirrels or rabbits? What makes humanity different than all the other creatures on the earth in the way we look at ourselves? Ah, maybe that's kind of ethereal. Let me ask you some simpler questions. What color is a mirror? What does water taste like? Water, yeah. You know, do you get the idea? There, there are some things that even though you deal with them every day, if you're challenged to explain them to somebody else, you're going to find yourself struggling to put into words what you kind of intuitively grasp. Well, the folks in first century Corinth are having difficulty with explaining the idea of a resurrection and eternal life. They're Christians, so they believe that Jesus is going to give them eternal life. They believe they've got an eternal home waiting for them in heaven. But not everybody is ready to accept that. Some people are, are going to say, give me some proof. Explain that to me. W what do you mean? I heard about one skeptic who had had a leg amputated in England, and then she came to live in New York. And her skepticism caused her to ask, well, when I'm resurrected, how am I going to get back together with my leg? Paul answers questions like that with, how foolish. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 15, and he starts explaining to us what we really need to understand. Here's what God wants us to know and to be able to express about the resurrection body. When you are resurrected from the dead you will have a body that will be similar to the body that you have now, and yet in some very important ways it will be very different. We know that because when the apostles talk about the resurrection body, they compare it to Jesus' resurrection body. That's really the only example we've got of a body that came back out of the grave, never to go back into the grave. The other people who were resurrected died again later. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 49, Paul says, Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we will bear the image of the heavenly man. So our resurrection body is going to be like Jesus' resurrection body. Well, there were similarities between Jesus' resurrection body and the body that went to the cross. You'll remember that after his resurrection, when Thomas expressed doubt, he said, until I can see the nail prints in his hand and, and put my hand in that place that they opened up in his side, I won't believe. And so a week later, when Jesus appeared to all the apostles and Tom, Thomas was present again, Jesus said, 
Okay, Thomas, you needed to examine. There's my hands. Here's my side. Even after his resurrection, Jesus' body had similarities to the body that went to the cross. It was still recognizable in that way. And yet, it was also very different. When Jesus appeared to his apostles, he did so by appearing inside a locked room without going through the door. How do you do that? Obviously, his body has some physical characteristics now that, that can't really be explained. He, he can go through walls or enter a locked room and not use the door. Jesus physically had a body that ascended into the clouds. The, the apostles stood on the Mount of Olives and watched him go into heaven. But when he gets into heaven, Jesus' body has a different appearance. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we're told that it has two, at least, different appearances. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, this is the description of Jesus. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. So in heaven, at least in Revelation chapter 5, Jesus takes the form of the lamb who has been slaughtered the sacrifice to pay the price for the sins of the world. But then over in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus has a different appearance. John writes, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. There, instead of looking like a lamb that's been slain, Jesus looks like a conqueror going out to war. We know it's him because he's the Word of God. He has that robe dipped in blood. But now, he's the victorious one who's going to lead into battle and conquer all opposing forces. Our bodies, somehow, are going to be like His resurrection body. Similar, recognizable, here's my hands, here's my side, and yet different because Jesus could appear inside locked rooms without using the door. Jesus could float into heaven. Jesus can appear and change his appearance different times. Sometimes to be a lamb, sometimes to be the conqueror. How's that going to work out in our world? Well, Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians and he tries to explain it to us. He says... We will be sown perishable, but raised imperishable. When we stick a body into the ground, the body begins to decompose. I read about the body of Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island. For some reason, they exhumed his body, and in the exhumation process, they found out that the root of an apple tree nearby had grown through through, through uh, Roger Williams' casket. So when you ate an apple, you got a little bit of Roger. <laughs> Ooh. You know. It's, it's, it's perishable. It rots. But the body that's raised will be imperishable. He goes on, he says, sown in dishonor, raised in glory. 
it's always amazing to me to stand at a funeral visitation and, and listen to the things people say. They stand there in front of the casket and they look down and say, oh, doesn't she look good? Oh, it looks so natural, just like he's asleep. The funeral director takes that as a tremendous compliment. It means he's done his job well. He's stuffed people's cheeks with cotton because they're all sunk in at the time of death. He's either put on little plastic eye caps or he's glued the eyelids shut so that you get that natural sleep appearance. He's added some rouge to the cheeks and he's done some makeup to try to make things look just as healthy and normal as possible. Well, when you stand there and say, oh, doesn't he look good? The funeral director thinks, I did good because I took a piece of rotting trash and turned it into an artwork. It is sown in dishonor. There's nothing honorable about death and what happens afterward, but it's raised in glory. I read about a German doctor, Gunther von Hagens, who developed a traveling exhibit that he called Body Worlds so that people would understand the process of death and, and maybe appreciate some of the things that are built into the human body, Von Hagen's created this exhibit of partially dissected human bodies. He opened up the chest cavity in some, peeled aside a bit of the face in others, it's kind of gross, and some countries in the world and, and some states here in the United States have banned the exhibit because it's just kind of macabre to think of, of this dead person who used to have a life, and now we're, we're exhibiting their body? Where's the dignity in that? One French judge said that putting dead people on display for profit is a violation of the respect that's owed to them. Yeah. Tone in dishonor. But it'll be raised in glory. Tone in weakness. You know, the one thing that we can pretty much bet on is that you are not going to leave this world as a healthy, normal human being. You're going to get old and worn out you're going to get sick or you're going to have some kind of an accident. The body that you have now is weak. It is susceptible to different kinds of problems and one of those problems will probably eventually take you out. But your body will be raised in power. We may bury a physical body, but we will raise a spiritual body. The mortal will be replaced by the immortal. Now, I can't explain all that. I can't tell you exactly how all that's going to happen. I believe it because it's been revealed to us in Scripture. And I believe God is able to do those things. So, some of the Corinthians were saying, when do we get that body? And that really takes us to the questions that we most want to know. What happens when I die? And when am I going to get my resurrection body? What happens when I die? And when am I going to get my resurrection body? Well, verses 51 to 53 say, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. So, if you're alive at the time the Lord returns, you're going to get your resurrection body right then. You will be changed. It'll just happen, 
And you'll trade the flesh of this world for whatever flesh it is that you're going to carry into your eternal life in heaven. If you have died, you will get your resurrection body at the time of Christ's return. The dead will be raised imperishable. And so that rotting flesh that's in the ground will be raised and it will be changed and it will become a glorious body, a powerful body, an immortal body. And, and you'll get that body at the time of Christ's return. Okay? But where will I be until that happens? What, what's going to happen at death? Where will I go? What will I be like? What will I know about the time passing? Well, here's what the Bible teaches. When believers die, they go to be with Jesus. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, that will mean faithful labor for me. And yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Where's Paul say he's going to go if he's executed? Where's he going to go when he dies? I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. So when you leave this body behind in death, you are going to be at home with the Lord. Apparently what happens when we die is that our spirit goes to heaven and it is with Jesus. But in some kind of a disembodied state. We don't get our resurrection body yet, but we're still blessed. We're still with Jesus. We're still enjoying eternity. And then Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, and he explains to us what's going to happen next. Brothers, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The Lord will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. So when you die, you will go to heaven, you will be there with Jesus you will begin to enjoy the blessings of eternal life, but without your resurrection body. But then when the Lord brings those folks with Him to collect the rest of us who haven't died yet, then somehow that decaying body will come from the ground or, or from the ashes or from the sea, wherever it's been placed, and you'll get a resurrection body that will carry you into heaven and carry you throughout eternity. Now that's kind of difficult to understand. And I wish I had a dollar for every time that I have taught that lesson and had people raise their hand a week or two or three later and come back to that subject and ask more questions. I've gone over it and over it and over it. And there's little charts that I can draw. I don't draw well, maybe that's part of the problem. 
maybe part of the problem is I'm just not a good teacher and I don't explain it clearly enough. Or maybe the problem is it's just a deep subject. Paul understands that. He knows that in spite of the things that he's written there in 1 Corinthians 15 to explain to us what will happen at death and how we'll, we'll have a corrupting body that will go into the ground but we'll have an incorruptible body coming out of the ground and we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. Paul gets the fact that, that some of that may go over our heads. And so he gives us this takeaway. He tells us what we do need to worry about when there are some other things that we can't explain. He says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. And I think that's his way of saying, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. Maybe you can't explain those things, but the Lord will take care of them when the time comes. He's got it all under his control. And you don't have to worry that you can explain or not explain the resurrection of the dead. If you know Christ, you'll be part of it. And it'll all become clear then. Let nothing move you. And so instead of worrying about those things that you can't understand or explain, those things that are difficult, here's what you can do. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. Instead of worrying about all that ethereal heavenly stuff, just focus on living as a believer right now and doing all the good you can. I've heard the phrase, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. And that's wrong because, in fact, the more heavenly minded you are, the more good you will do on earth. The more your heart is tuned in to the heart of God, the more of a blessing you're going to be to the people around you. And so give yourself to that. Maybe you don't understand all that heaven and resurrection body stuff and you can't explain how molecules of a, a body that have gone into the ground are, are going to come out again and, and be eternal molecules. Maybe, maybe you can't explain it, but you will live it. And until then, just get ready for it by living as a believer and making yourself a blessing in the world around you. Stand firm. Paul writes, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. You take care of living for Jesus and he'll take care of everything else. And that brings us to invitation time. There are some who have not given their lives to Christ they're carrying around a load of sin and they need to get rid of it. It can be washed away in baptism this morning. If you have not become a Christian and you are ready to say, I need a Savior, I believe in Jesus, I want His blood to cover my sins. If you're ready to be baptized, then we're going to stand and sing an invitation hymn. And this is your opportunity to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Stand with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Turn.
terms of announcements, we have migrated over to the new Tithely app. If you're interested in that, you can download that. The instructions are in your bulletin. Uh, we want to start a uh, restart, really, uh, the baby nursery for our youngest Pine Pinehurst family members. Uh, if you're um, interested in that, if you're willing to take a turn in providing child care, please let Mark or Pam Lang know that, uh, that you'd like to be part of that as they put together a plan and a, and a schedule for that. There, uh, again, you can check the bulletin and see that information. Uh, we have coming up a uh, fellowship time of fishing and fun at Davlin Lake on August 14th at 4 p.m. Oh. oh, okay. I, I noticed the, the Valley Gem on the announcements on the, on the, uh, the beforehand. Okay, so if you notice the Valley Gem uh, boat trip coming on August 21st, that's replacing the Davlin Lake August 14th, 28th. Two weeks, not one week. Okay. August 28th. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, we have one prayer request that uh, has been shared with us. I would like to remind everybody we do have the, the little notes if you want to make sure that you fill those out if you have prayer requests to add. Um, we've been asked to pray for Martha Feathers. Uh, she's been diagnosed with, with breast cancer. Are there any other uh, prayer okay. updates or prayer requests? Well, let's all stand, and we'll have our closing prayer and then our closing chorus. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time uh, this morning when we've been able to gather together and lift our voices in worship and to hear the, your word preached. Father, I pray that, it, um, that the message just touches the hearts of, of all who are here and uh, helps to clarify our own walk with you and... Uh, inspire us to uh, grow closer and to just to serve your kingdom Lord to find those ways where we can we can help where we can serve and we can spread the gospel message of salvation through Jesus Christ we want to lift up to you uh, all those on our prayer list uh, we want to specifically mention Martha who are adding to the prayer list and we pray for <clears throat> a good outcome in terms of the treatment for her cancer. Uh, Lord, we just know that you're the great physician and that you do care for us and love us and that you are uh, infinitely powerful and you can, you can answer prayer and you, you do answer prayer. But we know especially <clears throat> that your answers to prayer are for the purpose of furthering your kingdom, Lord. And so we ask that your will be done and that we, we understand that, that we can, um, we can see your, your hand working in answers to prayer. Father, uh, we also ask that others can see, those who don't know you, can see your hand working in answers to prayer. Lord, thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice for us, and in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.